Okay. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to our second session of uh, international webinar on pediatric airway problems. Uh, the child is the father of the man, thus said famous English poet William Wordsworth. Used, he used this expression in a positive sense, noting that seeing a rainbow produced an awe and joy when he was a child, and he still felt those emotions as a grown man. Hence, childhood experiences are very, very important. Children are a unique set of patients who deserve special care so that their childhood experiences are not dreadful. Pediatric airway problems are a distinct set of issues that pose a significant challenge to all stakeholders. The parents and the entire pediatric airway team, and we have the responsibility to address those concerns in a, be concerns in a befitting way. Uh, thus, friends, we are organizing this event to disseminate that essential knowledge some of the best brains from all over the world. With this, I welcome the moderator of this program, Dr. Eviraman, who is unable to join right now. So, interim Dr. Uh, Suja Sridharan from KMC Bangalore will be there. Uh, uh, Dr. Raman is Director of Pediatric Airway Team at Manipal Hospital Bangalore, who has become a kind of synonym, synonym with pediatric, pediatric airway science in India. A small trivia about Dr. Raman, uh, he has been instrumental in creating a corpus fund amounting to about uh, rupees 80 lakhs, which is more than uh, $100,000 to help children with airway problems. Most of such patients are very poor and they are being treated free of cost. Uh, that is highly commendable job, but he will be here uh, soon, Dr. Raman. Okay. Um, until then, uh, Dr. Suja, uh, she will coordinate the event. I think first we have uh, uh, Dr. Ajay okay. Matthew. Yeah, Dr. Ajay. So I'm going to uh, make him, I think I've already unmuted him. Yeah, I had to unmute him. Okay. So, uh, so today Dr. Ajay? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah uh, Dr. Raman will come. Once he's able to join, he will uh, introduce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So, Dr. Ajay, uh, per perhaps you'd like to start your presentation? Yeah, I'll start. Yeah. Okay, good evening everyone. So we will start. I know there was a little bit of delay. There's still some issues with the password, but I hope that it will be sorted soon. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Prahlad uh, for this wonderful platform. I'd also like to thank Dr. Raman. He's been, I mean, really a exuberant character who's really pushed this forward. So today, what I'd also like to thank Dr. Deepa and Dr. Essie, who will be the host co-presenters uh, with me and we hope to take you on on an exciting journey for probably the next hour or so. So what we'll do is I'll start on uh, the technique of pediatric tracheostomy. Dr. Deepa will take the patient right from OT to ICU, take care of the patient in ICU and then on and Dr. S.E. will go on to looking at the complications of the patient. So that is the plan as of now. So a 14-year-old boy is brought with breathing difficulty. He had swallowed a bag of coins to prevent a theft by highwaymen. So this was the predicament of French surgeon Nicolas Habicot in 1620. And this is the first reported case of uh, tracheostomy in the pediatric age group. Uh, pediatric tracheostomy is a fantastic operation. It is also a futile and an irresponsible idea. So you get the oxymoron of the concept of pediatric tracheostomy. We are standing on the shoulder of giants and none more taller than uh, Dr. Chevalier Jackson. In 1909, he had written about the considerations that you need to have when you do a tracheostomy. And that holds good today also. Uh, strict asepsis proper positioning of the patient, selecting a candle of the correct size, deliberate midline dissection, and careful after treatment. So he's covered what most of what we are supposed to talk today. Now my outline is to look at the considerations before surgery, look at tracheostomy tubes, a bit about the surgical technique and immediate post-op care, following which Dr. Deepa will be continuing with the care of the baby. So the indications, uh, can be broadly classified into infectious causes, prolonged ventilation, 
and upper respiratory obstruction. And over the years, this has changed from infectious cause being the main cause to prolonged ventilation because of neurological issues. So in our series, we had about 44% patients who have had a tracheostomy because of neurological problems and 22 because of airway obstruction. And this is similar to series of Raman who, uh, where he published, I think in 2018, where he had about 46% neurological and about 15 upper airway obstruction. So this means that the air has to be more prolonged. So once you decide about doing a tracheostomy, the first thing is to counsel. And for that, first we have to have a multidisciplinary meeting. So the parent team, that is the pediatrician or the pediatric neurologist, the ENT team, the ICU team, along with anesthesia, nursing, the speech language pathologist, and any other team that needs to be involved in the care of the child have to have a meeting and decide on the plan of the baby and all have to be on the same page. Next thing is to talk to the family. There's no point hiding the head in the sand. We have to match expectations to reality. Family needs to be motivated and they need support, not just family support, but also support from the hospital staff. First thing that we need to talk about is the expected result or prognosis in terms of primary diagnosis. Now, if you look at the neurologically impaired group, they have a less likelihood of having a decannulation. So this is a study that was conducted, I mean, that was published in 2016. Where we have seen that the neurologically impaired group had a poor one year and a five year decannulation rate as compared to the non-neurologically impaired group. And this is a similar thing which was seen in Dr. Raman's paper, where 12 of the 26 children who he could not decannulate because of neurological problem. Parents also need to be told of the risks involved in surgery, need for ICU stay, and the expected results in terms of all laryngeal functions, be it airway protection, breathing, eating, and voice. And it has to be individualized to that patient. And financial consideration is definitely important in our setup. We do not have insurance like in the West. This is our unpublished data where we have looked at household income and the mean wages lost because of tracheostomy. And we found that about 20% of the house, mean household income is needed for tracheostomy care, be it uh, support of the patient or for unexpected visits to the hospital. Caregiver burden is not just finance. We also need a 24-7 uh, support. It cannot be a one-person job. And we have to make sure that the family has got enough support to take care of the baby before seven. Once consent is done, then we need to decide where to do the tracheostomy and when to do the tracheostomy. In a resource scarce country like India, we probably have to think of ICU as a setting for doing a tracheostomy. Our indication do in ICU is children less than four years with no deranged bleeding parameters and in whom we do not anticipate any difficulty. This is similar to a paper that was published in Iran where they had 45% of their tracks performed at bedside with a mean age of around 62 months, that's about five years, and they had no added risk in bedside tracheostomy. Additionally, pediatric tracheostomies are delayed up to 21 days. But recent paper suggests that it is better to do early if you are considering mechanical ventilation. So this is a systematic review published this year. And the length of PICU stay and the length of hospital stay has been drastically reduced by doing a tracheostomy earlier than 14 days. So this is the uh, about uh, up to seven days and this is a study from eight to 14 days. And combined, we, there is a reduction of about 10 days of PICU stay and about 25 days of hospital stay for patients having an early tracheostomy. Again, hospital-acquired pneumonia is much less in patients who have had a tracheostomy done early. We also need to look at the material of the tube, the type of the tube that is used, and the size of the tube. We prefer to use silicon tubes as opposed to siliconized PVC tubes or PVC tubes. And our protocol is to use Bivona as the first tube and give Portex tube as a spare considering the cost factors. I have to say that I have no financial disclosures in this any of these products. 
Over the years, cuff tracheostomy tubes have become more common, especially in ICU on patients who need ventilation because of the introduction of low pressure cuffs and also good ICU management measuring cuff pressures. In specific cases, we may use a hyperflex tube or an adjustable flange tube. Sizing the tube is important. So usually, we go by age-based formula. The commonly used formula is look at a size h by 3 plus 3.5 internal diameter. And if it if you need a long-term uh, long-term care, then you may have to resize it every two years. There are ready reckoners which are available. This was published from GOS, Great Ormond Street in 2008. Recently, we have these mobile apps. So it's very easy nowadays. You just have to download the app, just give the age and the type of tube, and it will tell you the size, the uh, diameter, and the length of the tube. Length of the tube is important. So we uh, this was published in uh, Langoscope in 2009 by, by Dr. Naina. Uh, what we did is we looked at uh, CT scans of uh, children who were had a scan for reasons other than for airway issues. And we found that length of trachea from the proposed tracheostomy type to the carina was longer than most uh, than the size of uh, the length of most conventionally av available tubes. So we usually prefer to have neonatal tubes for especially the smaller children to avoid the tubes becoming longer and going into one of the bronchus also need to make sure that you have the right suction catheter. You, the usual dictum is to use a catheter which is uh, two sizes above the size of the tracheostomy tube. So multiply the tracheostomy tube size by two and gives an approximate size of the catheter. And length needs to be measured so that you assure that you don't push that suction too much into the trachea. Uh, Dr. Deepa will be talking more about suction when she does post-op care. Now going on to the technical considerations in the operation theater. So I've divided this into two. First is positioning of the patient to dissection up to the trachea, and then going on to do the tracheotomy per se. So trachea is usually pliable in children. And so as far as possible, uh, tracheostomy is done in intubated children. Or in children, if you can't intubate, sometimes you use a ventilating bronchoscope and to the tracheostomy over that, and but this is very rare. Children also have a large occiput, have a short neck, and the pleura can come into the neck if you overextend. So you should avoid overextension. Put a shoulder bag under the shoulder, and if need be, put a small ring under the head or a folded sheet under the head. Usually, children have redundant tissue uh, below the chin, so it is always good to do a Albertine strap. It's, Essentially, putting a strap from the chin onto the top of the table so that the chin is elevated or the soft tissue under the chin gets elevated and you have free access to the neck. In children, one, uh, the most common landmark that can be identified in the neck is the cricoid, not, not the thyroid like in the adults. So, usually we have a horizontal skin incision which is placed Yes, sir. Sorry, my video got stuck. So. Oh, okay. I'll do that. So, so you make a horizontal incision, usually midway between the cricoid and the uh, sternal notch. Usually in children, what you have is you have a lot of redundant uh, fat in that subcutaneous plane. And it's good to remove that fat when you are doing the tracheostomy. Once you do that, you do a midline dissection and meticulously keep to the midline as far as possible. Next is tracheotomy per se. First thing that you need to do is to confirm that you are reach the trachea. The problem is that children and the trachea is usually very pliable in children, and you can actually pull the trachea with one of the retractors if you are not careful. So you usually do a triple confirmation of the trachea. First is a visual inspection where you are actually looking at the trachea. The second is palpation where you actually palpate the tracheal rings and you can actually feel the tracheal rings 
and the third is to aspirate air and once you aspirate air you know that you are in the trachea next comes the tracheal incision so there are different methods of doing tracheal incision the most common method is to use a, a vertical incision on the trachea the other options are to do a inferior blazed or a superior blazed flap or make a window on the trachea why is this important because clinically important stenosis that requires intervention is about 3 to 12 percent this is in long term tracheostomies and we feel that the type of incision that is made may play a role in this complication so if you make a vertical incision and you put a circular tube in that incision there is a likelihood of that ex incision extending also when these patients are connected to the ventilator there is some movement of the tracheostomy tube which can cause the, uh, uh, the incision to get extended we also feel that doing a vertical incision uh, violates the roman arch principle and can lead to cicatricial afferent deformity later on again these are more anecdotal because if you look at the total numbers the uh, complications are not that much so we feel that it is better to take a small window of trachea what we do is we use methylene blue and mark the uh, tube with methylene blue and press that on the trachea to get an impression of the tube on the trachea so that lets us know how much exactly of the trachea we need to remove to create the tracheal window so that tube has already been marked what we are doing now is to take a stitch on the tracheal cartilage that needs to be removed the advantage of this stitch is that it allows us to have a good visualization of the trachea and the instrument don't come in our view while making the window so the exact dimension of the tracheostomy tube is removed while we do the window accidental decannulation is a major concern of tracheostomy in fact it is the primary cause of tracheostomy related fatality in children now what are the considerations if you do a midline dissection and not dissect the lateral planes if you put a mature stoma and if you place a tie properly there is a good chance that you can avoid accidental decannulation or if at all you get decannulated you can put the tube back easily reducing the chance of morbidity now, there are two ways to mature the stoma the common classic way is to put stay sutures stay sutures are on either side of the vertical incision and these stays are left for a week to 10 days after the surgery till the first tube change and you are sure that the stoma is mature the other way is to do a maturation suture so this is what we normally do a maturation suture is a one and a half mattress suture this is like what we do for a laryngectomy so the stitch starts uh, on the skin and the throw goes to the trachea the cartilage comes out close to the mucosa and then goes back onto the skin so this is a one and a half mattress the advantage of that is that it puts the uh, skin close to the trachea mucosa so what we do is we put four stay sutures we put it at two o'clock at uh, four o'clock at six at eight o'clock and at ten o'clock so the advantage of putting four stays on four sides is that the skin is pulled close to that mucosa and you have a mature stoma so this is the end product so at the end of when you do the stitch what happens is the skin gets pulled in towards the trachea you have a mature stoma so the advantage is that stoma is already well formed unlike in common practice where once the tube comes out you are worried whether you will be able to put the uh, tube back into the stoma so that is the advantage of having a maturation suture that's the fourth stitch that is going in and once you have that you have a fairly well formed stoma already and you can put the tube through that stoma so it's fairly easy then to put the tube without getting into the uh, wrong plane these are our results we have looked at uh, studies where uh, tracheal incision and maturation sutures 
were uh, highlighted in the study. We had a complication rate of early uh, complication of 2%. This was a two block which needed resuscitation. And this compares favorably to other uh, studies where there have been vertical incisions. Where the uh, complication rate ranges from 46 to 9.4%. So once the tube is in place, you have to confirm the position of the tube. Uh, you look at chest rise. You have to make sure that the chest is rising equally on both sides. Ask the anesthetist to auscultate. And then look at the uh, carbon dioxide egress in the ETCO2. So once you know that the carbon dioxide is coming out and the ETCO2 is coming up, then we know that the tube is in place. There are some centers that use a flex bronc to actually look at the position of the tube, but we don't do that. and we do a chest x-ray postoperatively in the ICU. Once the tube is in place, then we have to tie. We don't uh, suture the flanges to the trachea, uh, to the skin, although it is done in certain centers. Documentation is important. We have to document the indication for doing the surgery, the site where the tracheostomy was placed, the type of uh, tracheal incision that was made, what size tube was used and the type of tube that was used. All this should be documented or follow up. The surgeon has to accompany the child to ICU, the anesthetist and hand over the patient to the ICU team. And the first tube change is usually done by the surgeon who does the tracheostomy. Take all precautions, have one assistant, keep the tray open, extend the neck like you do a normal tracheostomy and then do the tube change. So always good to have a protocol. This is our protocol up to the tracheostomy, up to doing the tracheostomy. Uh, since uh, Dr. Deepa is doing the rest of the talk, I thought I will not put those protocol up. So now that the surgery is done, the tube is in, the anesthetist is happy, the surgeon is happy, it is time for the baby to be shifted to ICU and Dr. Deepa will be taking over to shift the baby to ICU, care of the baby in the ICU immediately the week first tube change and then onto the ward and then long term follow up i'd like to thank uh, dr prahlad dr raman uh, i would like to mention my mentors dr koroto and dr Peng, who have been instrumental in getting me onto this exciting journey of pediatric ent and pediatric airway my colleagues who have been a uh, strength for me and my fellows past, present and future who, who have always been there. When faced with a challenge, look for a way, not a way out. And I hope that pediatric tracheostomy will be a fantastic operation, not a futile and irresponsible idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajay. Uh, I think Dr. Raman has not yet joined us, but uh, there are a lot of doubts. Sir. Uh, will you be able to take one or two questions? Yeah, I can do that or we can have it at the end, depending on what you want. Uh, I think maybe one or two you can take now yeah. because it is related to your talk. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Dr. Suja, uh, Dr. Raman has joined. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. I'm extremely sorry. I was uh, present in absentia. Part of the talk I could hear and it was outstanding, uh, Ajay. Uh, thank you. Suja, thank you so much for standing by. Uh, I think technical problems always happen, but you're uh, uh, entitled as much as possible. I mean, as, as and when you want, please intervene and make this a very exciting uh, session. Um, I think we'll take the questions a little later. Shall we go on to the next talk? Okay. Um, uh, is that okay, Pralad? Yeah, yeah, yeah perfectly all right, sir. You're the boss. No. You're to <laughs> no, I just uh, stepped in as a 12th yeah. man now. I wanted to make sure <laughs> no, that no, no. Yeah. Because it was going so beautifully. And Ajay, it was really great. Now, I have the proud privilege of presenting the next speaker, Deepa who uh, is our fellow and uh, she's very passionate about whatever she does and she on her own has uh, tried to uh, formalize, systematize, protocolize uh, the uh, pediatric tracheostomy procedures in our hospital and uh, she's going to present her, um, you know, um, uh, whatever she's come out with and then we can have a discussion on anybody doing anything differently and I'm sure they will uh, ask, eminent speakers will answer the questions. Without much ado, I present uh, Dr. Deepa. Uh, thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Raman, sir. This is all your work only, which I'm going to present here. Thank you, Pralat, sir, for arranging this talk and all the panelists who have come here to guide us. So let's talk about post-tracheostomy care. 
uh, it is very important to know why post tracheostomy care is important. So let me show you uh, a study which has been published two years back in Indian Journal of Otolaryngology, which has uh, shown and documented that two year, two decades back, the indications for tracheostomy were totally different. It was pediatric. Uh, the airway obstruction was the most common, which needs the short duration follow. But now, after two decades, the indications have changed. And on top of the list has come the prolonged ventilation, which uh, includes neurological and cardiopulmonary problems. So this starts why it is important to know post tracheostomy care step by step, because you are going to take care of the child for long, long duration. So uh, let's start. As Dr. Ajay sir said that it starts, post tracheostomy care starts from the theater sign out. Once you put the tracheostomy tube inside the child's neck, and this is the time whenever you are giving this handover to the PICO or NICO team, you should tell about the patient details, what exactly the age is, what was the indication. This is very important to tell the indication, whether it is neurological cause or the airway obstruction, is for the accidental dislodgement, the PICO NICO team should be ready and anticipate that this would be the difficult intubation if the indication was uh, airway obstruction. Then we should mention the size of the tube so they can keep ready with the same size and the one size down. We should tell them what intra-op complication we faced, if at all whether we got some bleeders, so we can you know, expect some, whether there will be some hematoma or some emphysema so, or pneumothorax. So, uh, we should tell proper handover by the doctor or the nurse the atten to the attending doctor is very important. Then the post-op chest x-ray, which shows uh, where the tracheostomy tube tip is exactly lying. Ideally, it should be two to three rings away from the carina, above the carina. So to check the tip of the position, uh, position of the tip and to check whether we have developed any surgical emphysema. So post-op x-ray is important. Post-op instruction about the suctioning, how frequent we should perform and dressing, especially for dressing, we always write that do not touch the dressing for first 24 hours. And if at all it is required, only ENT surgeon should perform. And then the humidification and nebulization. Recently, one study has come up with the, for the nebulization and we have also started following that with the 1% of 4 ml lidocaine, plain lidocaine and 1 ml saline. This 5 ml solution we give first, second hour and the 10th hour post-operatively. And we have seen it reduce the cough and the pain uh, to in, uh, in pediatric age group. And then the cuff pressure. As we know that cuff should be some, mostly the neonatal and uh, infant cases, the cuff is uh, not there, but for ventilated patient, if we are using the cuff tube, then we should tell them that cuff pressure should not exceed 20 millimeters of mercury. We usually kept that at 18, but adult we know it is 25 to 35, but pediatric, it should not cross 18 to 20, otherwise capillary compromise will happen and tracheal injury will be more. Then, uh, as we know broadly, tracheostomy care is majorly the track care and the stoma care, but it is more beyond that. So what exactly it is? We have to see when to do the tube change, what it is required, regular cleaning, how to perform, airway protection, with what all things we can do, complication awareness and how to prevent those, then home kit requirement, things to keep ready bedside, Emergency situations when the patient or the caretaker or the nursing staff or attending doctor should report us and call us. Oral hygiene, the stoma and skin care, most importantly, yes. The tie care, outer and inner tube cleaning, and majorly the mucus problem because we know the most disastrous complication is the tube block. So how to prevent those and what are the suctioning tips? And last but not the least, your child's safety, what all they should know. So this post tracheostomy care is you know, it's a combo pack all together. So let's start with the tube change. As Ajay sir already explained, the first tube change we generally perform on the post-op day 7th and where we remove the maturation suture and the stay suture as well. As we know, around age uh, day 3 or 5, the stoma will be mature. So it is safe to do the first tube change. 
and if the child is already you know neurological indications are there then sometimes they stay longer in the hospital so we prefer the second tube change before they are getting discharged roughly at 3 to 4 weeks otherwise ideal duration regular interval between two tube changes we keep 4 to 6 week but we know for the portex ideal is 2 to 3 weeks and bevona you can exceed for 3 to 6 months time but for portex itself we prefer at least 28 days uh, not prior to that then the preparation yes for the tube change two sorts of preparation one the preparation of the patient and the preparation of your trolley so patient preparation before the tube change you should give the humidification to the child nebulization chest physiotherapy to loosen the secretion then pre oxygenate the child because once you do this child may go into the apnea and o2 desaturation so pre oxygenation is also important and the preparation for the trolley we know we have to keep the same size tube one size down tube check the cuff whether any leak is there put the tie beforehand keep the syringe beforehand keep your dressing also ready once everything is ready then touch the patient position the patient deflate the cuff cut the ties and immediately just change the tube and make sure you have a helper and assistant on the other side then the procedure we all know how to perform the tube change but later we'll just discuss in detail so next is the regular cleaning okay cleaning of the tube is important usually the suction cleaning cleaners and catheters we we advise them to change after 7 days the stoma cleaning should be done every day at least once and if too much secretions are there twice also can be done then cl cleaning of equipments the suction bottle should be changed at least once in a day and entire equipment should be changed once in a month so let's see here see whenever we do uh, such procedure we explain the patient how to do the tracheostomy care and we ask their feedback and show their video so that we can know whether whether they are doing it properly or some mistakes are happening yeah. because they are the most important people who are going to take care of child and this care if it goes wrong we have to land up with the lots of complications so here is a dad who is showing how he has prepared everything for the uh, cleaning of the stoma we tell them to keep the suction also ready because the moment you touch the tube sometimes child may get cough and secretions will come up so they should be ready with the suctioning equipment as well then uh, here is the child you just go near to the uh, uh, stoma just be gentle and gently slowly you remove the dressing of the tracheostomy as i told you child may become agitated so they should be calm and relax so procedure should be gentle once you remove just inspect the stoma which i'll show you later in one more video then take the cotton gauze piece or peanut dip into the beta den or any other antiseptic solution do not use hydrogen peroxide at this level and clean hold the tube and clean from the 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock on the one half of the stoma first once it is done then just just tilt your tracheostomy tube again and go to the other side of the tube once you have done the cleaning with the antiseptic solution you have to clean the uh, stoma either with the normal saline or with the dry cotton pad and uh, just the dab and clean and dry the stoma once it is dried up you can use the dressing which is already uh, prepared by the parents then it can be inserted initially we used to tell them the cut the dressing in uh, center spread but now we are avoiding this now we have told them to make the inverted v shaped dressing and put those to prevent the fiber inhalation through the around the stoma and some foreign body aspiration from the tiny tiny cut off fibers so and then airway is open completely because of tracheostomy so how to protect that so the best is simple way is the wet gauze piece if it is a wet it will work as a humidifier and the gauze piece will take care of the filtration of the tiny particles and the dust particle but otherwise also you can go for hme which is heat moisture exchanger filters these are easily available in the market and now cost some 100 to 150 rupees it can be used for 7 days maximum but it should be daily clean under the tap water and once it is soiled because of excessive secretion it can be changed as well or you can use the track collar which you can see on the right top corner if it 
again, if it is a wet, it will work as a humidifier also. Track covers are available, bips are available. But most importantly is the deep breathing exercises and coughing exercise. We have to tell the parents to train their kids every hourly, they should cough at least eight to 10 times to release those secretions to prevent lower respiratory tract infection. So coughing exercises, again, important to protect the lower airway. Then the complication awareness. I won't talk about complication much here because we have separate talk uh, by Easy Sir, but how to prevent those? First and foremost is the hand hygiene. The moment you go near the child, you're touching the stoma, make sure your hands are clean. This will solve your 50% problem with the complications. Then regular cleaning of tube is important. Avoid water entering while bathing and cleaning and strict no-no for the swimming for the child. Keep your child away for the smoky, dusty and pollutant environment. And if at all it is required, please make sure your child is using HME filters and plenty of fluid is the key for the loose and thin secretions. If the secretions are thin, it is easy to suck out. And we know most disastrous complication is a tube block. So plenty of fluid is very important and regular suctioning. I'll just talk in detail about suctioning in a few minutes and tracheostomic kit. Yes, to avoid complication, they should have tracheostomic kit standby bedside. So what exactly it is? So whenever we are discharging the child, we make sure the child is going home with all these things. So we have a checklist for the tracheostomized children prior to discharge, which uh, has been checked by the sister. The child is having appropriate size embu bag. If it is a small child, 500, otherwise 1000 embu mask. Then tracheostomy tube of the same size and the one size smaller, appropriate size suction catheter, suction apparatus, oxygen, fingertip pulse oximeter, humidity vent, nebulizer machine, NS, everything. And we make sure that caregiver should be trained enough to suctioning of the tracheostomy tube and trained enough to change the tube in case of emergency. Okay, we are training the kids, the parents, everything about the change and all. It doesn't mean they have to take care by their own. They should know what are the conditions when they should report us. So if child is having breathing difficulty or high grade fever, in spite of regular suctioning, if uh, breathing is, you know, troublesome, then it is a time to call us. If child is having bleeding stoma or in suctioning, the blood stains are coming. If there is a foul smelling secretion, so child is having severe pain while suctioning, or there is a dislodgement of the tube. And uh, in spite of trying of the smaller size tube, if it is not able to put, then we tell them just put the smallest suction catheter and rush to the hospital. And if most importantly, if parents are having food particles while in the suction tip, it is suggestive of the child has developed tracheoesophageal fistula and though it is rare but in a chronic patient and if suctioning handling is not done properly this kind of complication also can arise or if the child has had aspiration we know the smaller kids infant and neonates they they usually go uh, with the spit outs after every feed so the, the moment uh, mom is uh, keeping that uh, straight and with the burp the small spit out comes and they are not sure mommy is not sure whether child has aspirated or not so if there is a doubt or if it is a typical sign of aspiration with coughing and child turning blue they should report to the hospital then comes the oral hygiene i won't talk much about it we know that yes good oral hygiene is important to prevent lower respiratory tract infection. To avoid this, uh, the uh, contamination, we should uh, try to do brushing twice a day and keep sure that uh, you use a separate oral suction to prevent the cross con contamination and mouthwash and rinsing can be done. Then comes the stoma care, which is the second most important part in the post tracheostomy care after the suctioning. So what are the signs of infection? The for skin care, we should look for the signs of infection, first of all. So here I'll show you this one more video. So whenever you are seeing the stoma and before cleaning, just gently remove the gauze piece and look for the signs of infection, whether skin is red, erythematous, or any bump is there, or any swelling is there. Just tilt the tube to the one half and inspect the upper half of the stoma. After the inspection, just gently hold and press with your finger and see whether the child has developed any tenderness, any severe pain, any swelling has arrived. Once you have done the upper half, just tilt 
that tube to the second half and look for the other side of the stoma. Again, inspect and palpate and document your finding. As here you can see, lots of granulation has happened. Once the skin around the stoma has been inspected and uh, seen, then comes to the uh, to look for a skin breakdown, which you can see under the flanges. So don't only look the stoma and come out. Just till the flanges of the tube and see whether any excoriation, redness, or any rashes have developed or not. And then go for the cleaning, as I already explained how to clean the stoma side, and the dressing part is also covered. Then comes the Thai care. Dr. Ajay sir has already told uh, you know about the ties of tight and loose pattern but when to change see usually we say at least once in a week then can change but some parents are very keen for frequent changing though we tell them not to change but if it is a soil it has to be changed then comes which tie we never uh, allow them and tell them to go for the velcro ties you know where the chances of dislodgement will be very high we always go with the cotton ties that two double ties and those are not easily available actually but we have found this twill uh, roll which is available on the craft shop or the shops where you can buy needle and uh, buttons so this is a nice soft can be used as a, as a tracheostomy ties and whenever it is soiled it can be changed and the tightness Sarah has already explained that if caregiver is able to insert one finger this is the adequate fit of the tie then comes the inner and outer tube cleaning outer tube is of course the main tube so whenever we are doing the tube change that time it can be clean and uh, usually portex we won't recommend twice or thrice uh, usage but yes bevona up to five times can be used and uh, inner cannula cleaning, we just uh, regular clean under the tap water if there are thin secretions. And uh, some people use brush, but we won't recommend brush. We are using the Q-tip or the normal uh, swab because uh, brushes can cause some scratches and damage and chances of biofilm generation will be more in those cases. But if thick crusts are there inside, then it should be soaked in the hydrogen peroxide diluted solution for 15 to 10, 20 minutes. And then again, go under the running tap water, dry it, dab it, keep it in the uh, paper bag and it can be used by the patient. Then come the most important part, the mucus problem, the suctioning tip. So when to perform the suction? So it is very important to know, always look the child for the breathing pattern, whether the child is having trouble breathing, any breathing difficulty, sigh breathing, seesaw pattern or paradoxical breathing. If, basically, if child is in, having trouble breathing, then uh, listen to the track sounds, whether any gurgling, crackle, secretory sounds are happening and feel the air blast. If you see the blast is reduced, there is no blast or gurgling sounds are there, this is the time to do the suctioning or regular basis it should be uh, performed. So whenever it is needed, suction should be done. As a routine, yes, if child is getting up in early phases, the secretions will be pretty uh, uh, more. So once the child is getting up or before sleeping or before having food or after the chest physiotherapy, after the nebulization when loose secretions are there, those are the routine indication when uh, the suctioning can be done. Indication, I have already told contraindication. Okay, this is not so the contraindication, but I strongly feel whenever you are putting the suction tip inside, never ever on your suction. It should be closed always when you are inserting the catheter. While taking out is the time to start the suctioning. So this is the only contraindication. But yes, there are some cautious conditions where you have to be a little precautious. Number one, if child is having traumatic brain injury, where child is already having increased intracranial pressure, chances are very high. And these procedures are a little painful uh, if you do the suctioning and all. So uh, the moment you touch the patient, child may get agitated and ICP may raise. So in those conditions, you have to be precautious while doing suctioning in a child. Second, if child is a child with coagulopathy or lower platelet count, the moment you do the suction or inadequate or you are going deep inside, the chances of bleeding will be more. And uh, you know you'll, you will land up into the excessive bleeding complications. So better be cautious in that condition. And the third condition, if the child is on bronchodilator and a known case of asthma, as we know, the, if the moment you take the wrong suction tip, if it is huge big, it can cause the bronchospasm and child can land up into the you know, O2 desaturation. So these conditions, you have to be a little cautious while performing suction. 
then the preparation yes again the preparation should be all aseptic as far as instrument and your suctioning is concerned and for the patient side patient should be humidified before nebulized before and if required chest physiotherapy and most important is the pre oxygenation because suction will take out a little bit of oxygen so child should be pre oxygenate deep breathing exercise should be performed before performing the suction then comes the suction uh, catheter size or just are already told it is roughly the guide of double the size if the uh, child is on size 4 then you can go for the 8 which is a blue color or if a child is on 5 size you can go for the 10 the black color catheter but the usual calculation is tracheostomy tube divided by 2 and multiplied by 3 we recommend the suction catheter should not be the more than 2/3 of the tracheostomy tube in a diameter so if we take roughly 50% by dividing the two and if you want to change it to french gauge you will calculate with the ideally it's 3.14 but for the calculation multiply by 3 then comes the duration never ever perform the suction more than 10 seconds in pediatric age group yes for the adult you can go for 15 second at a stretch never more than 10 seconds for pediatric and for infant and neonates just stop at 5 seconds you insert your catheter count 1 2 3 4 5 and just come off and the depth your suction tip uh, should not cross the tip of your tracheostomy tube so this is called the shallow suctioning earlier this was the concept with the cell shallow uh, suctioning and the deep suctioning where in the deep suctioning they say just insert your catheter and once you feel the resistance and come out and start suctioning but that is more traumatized and not uh, preferred nowadays so uh, shallow suctioning is good enough then uh, the suction pressure the, the suction pressure for pediatric is between 80 to 120 mm of mercury for neonate and infant it's still less 80 to 100 for the adolescents and uh, pediatrics you can go up to 120 when some of the suction machine comes with the kilopascal units if uh, parents are taking so this 80 to 20 comes around 10 to 14 uh, kilopascals range so you can tell them to it should not cross 12 to 14 according to the age of the child then this align installation we don't recommend generally but if at all it is required because of the thick secretion please do not put more than 2 ml that too in pediatric 0.5 ml and 1 ml is good enough for neonate and infant it should not be more than that it can cause the airway compromise and o2 saturation drop and then whatever you are doing the suctioning it should be documented it should be documented for color the consistency of secretion the smell whether the event was uh, okay or you got some drops or bronchospasm or uh, you know bp fluctuated and all then the specimen whether you are sending the specimen uh, for testing the documentation is important to check whether it is a recurrent event or it's just one odd incident which happened with the child so of course documentation is important as most importantly is the air entry always before suctioning please make sure you auscultate the chest to check the air entry and after the suctioning please make sure you auscultate the chest because if suction pressure is too high and too big suction catheter you are using you can cause the collapse of the lung tissue and atelectasis can happen so make sure you are auscultating and checking whether air entry has reduced or it's the same then as i told you that uh, we always ask for the feedback for the parents to see what what they are doing whether it is right or wrong because you know the education and this tip should go properly and correctly in their hand basically so we ask for the video and i'll just show you how things can go wrong and we can land up into the complication here is the dad he is preparing for the nebulization first before the suctioning he has put this align okay he has given this um you know the basic version of nebulization for home we are giving for the kids so they can uh, it involves in the tracheostomy kid and once we are okay then we are discharging so here the child is doing the nebulization once the nebulization is over then child has started um, okay dad has started doing uh, the suctioning you can see he has uh, measured the depth of the uh, suction catheter properly but look it's not it's not less than 10 seconds he is constantly and continuously sucking 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 though this child is comfortable and pretty okay but it doesn't mean all kids perform well so we we again called them and told them no this is not the way you have to count and it should be less than 10 seconds then wait between two suction uh, thing at least wait for 10 to 15 second let the child breathe take deep breathing and then you go for the sec second sitting it should not be more than 3 in one sitting and if at all it is required just wait for 15 20 minutes use this align installation then proceed with the further episode then comes 
the your child's safety, what all they should know. Yes, they should know when the child is having trouble breathing. They should ask for help. Always make sure that the tube should be mucus free and tracheostomy kit always should be ready with them. They should cover the tracheostomy tube with the HME and the gauze piece and they should know when to seek medical advice. So let's discuss some condition while uh, suctioning which uh, we, we can have in phase and how to prevent those. Suppose you are suctioning and suddenly decreased O2 saturation you are seeing on the monitor means you are you haven't pre-oxygenated the child or you are using big suction catheter. So make sure you use appropriate suction tube which we have already told you with the formula. Then if child is having sinuses then quickly perform the suction if air blast is not coming means it is a block tube then quickly perform the tube chain and all and if child is having dysarrhythmia again there is a, a pre-oxygenation not happen and child is going into the uh, you know low o2 saturation and heart heart rate is fluctuating then if there is a mucosal damage you are getting the blood in the aspirates means your your tip of the suction is touching the mucosal uh, you know, layer of uh, beyond the tip of the tube. So make sure you adequately mark the suction. Okay, all the tracheostomy tubes comes with the, the packet comes with the size of the inner diameter, outer diameter and length. As Ajay sir already mentioned, the length is very important. With that length, plus add one centimeter for the connector length, this much should be the length for your catheter insertion. If they cannot um, measure in the centimeter and mark that point, then they can keep one separate tracheostomy tube with them, insert and see whether tip is not crossing inside. Their uh, parent should hold and that is the maximum depth. If it goes beyond that, of course, the bleeding will happen and complication like tracheal stenosis and tip granulation will be seen. So just be gentle and use the suction appropriately. Then if the child has developed infection or increased secretions, yes, you have to perform aseptic technique to avoid all those complications. Again, heart rate and respiratory rate if it's increasing, then make sure your suction period and duration is not too more and you have gone to the appropriate depth with the appropriate size of suction tubing. Then fluctuating BP, again, if uh, too much uh, BP fluctuation is there, please stop, oxygenate the child and you know, uh, these, uh, Procedures are painful, so child must be having pain and BP must be shooting up, so give some analgesia or if required, please sedate the child and perform these procedures. And atelectasis, as I already explained, that you have to limit your pressures, you have to use appropriate size tubing to avoid this complication. And the bronchospasm, if child is having tendency to bronchospasm, please use bronchodilator, calm the child and give the long gaps between the suctioning. And if there is a tube block, yes, we have to change the tube and call for the help. So we have we have told them what is the uh, care required, what are the conditions, how to prevent. But it doesn't mean, okay, uh, everything is done, patient is ready to go home and now they're ready to come back. But you know, we, we get almost uh, four to six patients in a month and uh, same doctor is not dealing with them every time. And we don't remember after six months or three months whether any incidents happen in the last tube change. So we have prepared this tracheostomy information sheet that whenever patient is coming, we have to note down what was the tracheostomy date when it was done, how old the tracheostomy is, what is the track we should assume whether mature stoma is there or not, what was the major indication. Again, it is important to know on every tracheostomy tube change, but if it is an airway constant obstruction, then of course, if I'm not able to put the tube again, then we have to anticipate that difficult intubation will happen there. Then what is the size of the tube to keep ready? And when was the last tracheostomy tube happen, change happen? Any complication happened during that time? According to that sheet, I can anticipate the current situation when I'm performing the tube change. Then again, I have to document whether it is uh, done with the sedation or not, what size tube I'm using this time, what is the stoma examination, when, whether any granulation developed or not, and ET, ET, CO2 checked or not, track dressing have been done, any swam I'm sending for the testing, what is the breathing pattern for the child, everything is important. So the uh, this, this is done. So this concludes our talk. So now I want to give you the stay home message again for the post tracheostomy care, the tube change, day seven, 
four to six interval and whenever it is blocked, it has to be changed. Then regular cleaning of the tube and the stoma and the equipment is very important to prevent the infections and the further complications. Airway protection is mandatory with the HME filters or the track bibs. Then uh, they should know about the complication of tube block, any granulations, bleeding or excessive pain around the stoma. Home kit should be updated all the time. Then emergency situation, they should know when they should approach us. We are 24-7 available on the WhatsApp. They can send us the video and everything and we will help them out. Then oral hygiene, brushing twice daily. Stoma care, again, regular dressing and cleaning. Tie care, when to change. Inner tube and outer tube whenever required. And appropriate tubing till the tip uh, depth and the adequate pressure for the suctioning. If it is a too low pressure also, it will be inadequate and frequent suctioning will require, which will be more traumatized. So it, not, it should not be low pressure or not the high pressure. Then last, the, your child's safety. Look for breathing and breathing pattern. Listen for the track sound and feel the air blast. If we perform all this, track your stomach care properly, I'm sure 90% of the complication we can avoid. But still, there are some complications which Easy Sir will discuss in detail. So that concludes my talk. I want to say thanks to Dr. Raman because this is his work, his wisdom, his words, which I have presented here. Thank you so much, sir. I thank my patients also who have allowed us to give the consent to uh, use this videos and they are just updating us with the latest status of the child, how the child is performing. And definitely my team, my assistants, without their help, I cannot perform this, neither the surgery nor the post-op care. So I love my team and thanks to my great team. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, am I heard? Yeah. Yes, thank sir. you very thank much you, sir. for this comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, now, obviously, uh, technique of tracheostomy is very important, but as, imp as important as the technique of uh, uh, tracheostomy is, is the care soon after. And um, uh, we have a very distinguished panel here, a little change of uh, mind, change of heart. One is, of course, I have to welcome Suja for joining us as a panelist. She's a person with immense uh, interest in pediatric airway. And so is Mary. Mary is a known person here who uh, pioneered uh, the field of pediatric otolaryngology in the country. Then we have uh, um, Dr. Uh, Kishore Sandhu and Dr. Deepak. Both of them have been kind enough to join us. They have been our uh, principal, you know, people who have inspired us to do so many things over the years. And uh, I thought that maybe, and then we've got people like Amit Kishore who is there, then we've got Rakesh, we've got uh, Shashida, we've got Naina, we've got Anju, and a whole lot of partners in crime. So I want, uh, I was just wondering whether we could do a round of questions and we'll start off one by one. Uh, Mehdi, would you do anything uh, different? Uh, is is um, uh, Ajay here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Ajay, yeah, I thought we'll do a round of questions, otherwise people forget what they wanted to ask, although we have the chat box. We'll just do a few questions now. Uh, can um, uh, Any comments from the distinguished panel uh, on uh, Ajay's talk, anything that you do different? Uh, can we start with uh, Kishore? Kishore is unmuted. Yeah, I'm just unmuting him, sir. Yeah. Yeah, he's unmuted. Yeah, hi. Welcome, Kishore. Yeah, hi, Raman. Uh, thank you so very much. I think it was fantastic to hear uh, Ajoy and um, Deepa. Uh, just a couple of things. I think, you know, today we are seeing more and more of these very, very young children. So I think, you know, syndromic children, typically Pierre Robin syndrome, Pierre Robin sequences, Christmas children. So, you know, I think apart from things, you know, which we have, uh, like in securing the airway, I think. Problems in sort of securing the airway in these patients are very critical, meaning how do we actually secure the airway in these patients before we actually start doing a tracheostomy? So this is one aspect which is very critical. The second critical point is in the indications. I think we know that uh, the prolonged intubation and incipient subglottic stenosis 
is one of the main indications of doing a tracheostomy. So I think apart from the technique of doing a tracheostomy, it is really the basic question of site where a tracheostomy is done. So typically, these are different for subglottic stenosis, which actually is in CPN stenosis, that is a uh, stenotic condition, cases of laryngotracheoesophageal clefts. So where do we do a tracheostomy in these patients? Um, what happens? We always do a flexible bronchoscopy in all children before doing a tracheostomy and after doing a tracheostomy. And the reason is that, you know, these children typically who are syndromic, cardiac conditions, etc., they may have a very weird looking trachea, meaning they could have they could have complete rings, they could have micro tracheas, so they could have a lot of things. So I think pre-tracheostomy situations to understand uh, gives us a lot of information. And post-tracheostomy, we would remove the hyperextension at the neck. We would then evaluate again with a flexible endoscopy to see whether we have a selective passage of the cannula into one of the main stem bronchi. So I think, you know, a role of flexible endoscopy should not be, uh, should always be kept in mind. And I think, especially in these small children, it's really, really important. In my institution, I think the number of tracheostomies, pediatric tracheostomies have gone down drastically. We must have done one tracheostomy maybe in the last three or four years. So I think the number of tracheostomies, especially in children, is, is very, very little in, 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 our, in our cases. Thank you, Kishore. Uh, very uh, nice observations. So the importance of flexible uh, laryngoscopy to uh, laryngotracheoscopy, whatever, to have a look at the um, respiratory passage is very important. Now, uh, Deepak, can we uh, once again formally welcome you? And can somebody unmute Deepak? Yeah, I'm unmuted. So you're, Thank you're you. Coming, Deepak, sorry for the confusion in the uh, past uh, word oh, and no, things no. like that. Uh, usually it's perfect, but today I think one of those rare occasions. No, thank you. They were two great talks. I, I love the energy uh, you guys bring in. So a um, couple of other things I would add to what Kishore said. One of the other things, especially when you are doing your trach change, when you're inserting your trach tube, it's very important to communicate with your anesthetist because you already have an endotracheal tube. Okay, so make sure you're watching the endotracheal tube slowly being retracted so that you see the tip of the endotracheal tube at the top end of your incision. That way, the airway is not lost, okay? There are times when you're trying to put your trach tube in and you're not may, am able to do, the anesthetist can just push the tube back in. So it's very critical to communicate that part and leave the endotracheal tube till your trach tube is in, secured, and you know for sure the airway is secure. So that's a very important transition point where you're making sure that your tube is in position. The other point, uh, uh, Ajay had mentioned the incision, whether you may make a vertical incision or window, especially in younger kids, I would avoid making a window because you're taking out some excess tracheal tissue, which might end up causing some stenosis. So we typically just do a vertical incision. It ends up being a round thing, but you're minimizing the amount of tissue which is being taken out. So that would be our preference. And I think uh, the maturing of the stoma, which was mentioned, is a very good idea because what it does is it avoids the immediate post-op complications where you're, um, if there is accidental decannulation, you'll be able to put the trach back in more easily. So I think maturing the stoma, initially, when you're starting to do tracheostomy, it might look like, oh, I'm, I need to get the trach in quick. Don't worry about it. The, that's where the uh, anesthetist keeping the airway secured is important. You have time to mature the stoma. You don't have to worry about it. It's very, very rare. You have to put the tube urgently, then you'll have to do. But majority of situations, they should be controlled that you should be able to uh, do it. From, uh, I'm just thinking from post-op care, um, one of the things we do, and this is always evolving, it's very important to look at your practice to see where you can do better with your post-op care. One of the things we do is we put a board by the bedside which says, do not intubate from above, for example, or intubate from above with this size tube 
if the airway is okay and you're doing for a neurological cause, make sure you put a nice big board which tells because the ICU team, you might have done a handover, but the next team comes over, they might not know. The other thing is important is have the same size trach tube and one size smaller trach tube by them all the time because if that trach tube is blocked for any reason, you can't be cleaning it out there. Uh, so if you have the same size tube ready, you can insert it uh, right away. And sometimes if they can't, you can't put the same size, at least you have a smaller size. So always, even in your kit which goes with the patient, make sure they carry a same size tube extra and a down size tube. Thank you, Deepak. Quick comment, Suja? Uh, Anything you want to say? Yeah. And I think the talks are very good, of course. Uh, Dr. Ajay, uh, do you defect the skin uh, in some chubby children before you mature the stoma? We always uh, take that subcutaneous fat out. So once you make the skin incision, you take the subcutaneous fat out before we make the before we dissect the uh, tissue. Okay. And uh, this was also one of the questions, and I think many people have asked the question: uh, How do you know exactly where to make your uh, tracheostomy? In the sense, because your incision is uh, very small and your field of operation is very small. Uh, do you do a bronchoscopy or uh, Dr. Sandhu was mentioning fiber optic? Do you do a rigid or fiber optic? Do you do anything like that? We do not do any bronchoscopy before procedure unless unless you're looking at the airway. Like when you're thinking of a, I mean, a patient with a compromised airway, like say a fecal stenosis, you will have a look to say where it is. And then you make your tracheostomy at the site of your uh, uh, stenosis. If it is a neurologically impaired child or your tracheostomy is for a medical indication, then what we do is we always identify the cricoid. The cricoid can be identified by the cricothyroid muscle because that's the only muscle on the anterior surface of the trachea. So once you identify the cricoid, you leave the first ring, you go to the second ring and you uh, make your window there. That's what we generally practice. Okay. Dr. Mary, any quick comments before we move? Because we have got Dr. Ezi waiting with the complications. Excellent talk. And I, for as a pediatric surgeon, a pediatric ENT, always I don't know whether others have the problem. There is a sizing problem, always. Like, uh, you know, uh, I know there is a ready-made charts with this size, this tube. But in our country, I will tell you one example. I had a patient who was nine years old and he was only 15 kilos. So you have a situation, many a time we come within our country, we are in, you know, we have children, we have many other illness. So I just want to make and tell you all that. I think Ajoy did put a formula in his chart that is by Behel and Watt in, in the British Journal of Anesthesia way back in 2004. It's a wonderful formula. If you have an unusually uh, light for age or the other way, please use that formula because that has got an inner diameter and outer diameter. I will tell you, I, I actually had a saving day because of that, because we didn't know what to do. We went, we said, no, I cannot go by the age formula, inner and outer, that you can actually calculate. It's a wonderful formula. All of you, please remember, I, we, um, Ajoy has given, I will send a reference to the team. If you want. It's not often that you get, but once you get, if at all you get, this is a wonderful. I think more than that, I have nothing more to tell. Like Ajoy worked with, I was with Ajoy till my retirement. So that is. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Mary. And Dr. Raman, can I add one point? Yeah, yeah, sure. So normally in children, like if they are intubated with an endotracheal tube, the outer diameter of the endotracheal tube is a good diameter, a good uh, guide for you to decide on the tracheostomy tube. Right. So, so just look at the outer diameter of the endotracheal tube and take a corresponding size tracheostomy tube. So that is a now, one thing: the inner tubes come always by the inner diameter. So never forget. Right. But look at the outer diameter always. Yeah. For a surgeon, that is matter very important when you put in the tracheostomy. Thank you. We've got excellent material still left. I'll quickly call Dr. Ezi. Um, so, in spite of your excellent technique, in spite of your wonderful aftercare. And as you saw Dr. Deepa presenting, she's one person who chases the patient to their home and these videos are recorded from home and sent to her. She has some kind of a hold over her patients and that's how tracheostomy care is. It has to go right up to home and then the reviews, etc. In spite of all our best efforts, 
unfortunately, we have complications. And Izzy, with his uh, extensive uh, experience in Saifu Hospital, is going to enlighten on that. Dr. Izzy, you're already well known. Uh, please come and share your experience quickly with us because we have our Reserve Bank of India here, that is uh, Shashidhar and we've got uh, Rakesh. They have so much of material. Whenever I run short, I ask them. So we want to give a little time to them. So Izzy here, you can start. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Raman sir and Dr. Pralat to invite me on this webinar. I would be covering complications of tracheostomy. Dr. Ajay and Dr. Deepa has covered the two topics very brilliantly. And if everyone follows those points and practical tips which Deepa has given, the chances of complications would be very minimized. Here in this presentation, what I am going to show you is more of case examples which we have come across with a lot of different types of complications. Majority of the patients are pediatric, but there are a few case examples which are for adults. And this is as case examples to get an idea what exactly they look like. So the eyes see only what the mind knows. Now, this has already been covered by Dr. Rajoy and Dr. Deepa, so I would just uh, go through it and go fast on this. The complications can be classified into early complications, late local complications, and post decannulation complications. Early complications has already been covered, which are normally in the intensive care unit. The late local complications can be again divided into two types. First group would be with poor tube and stomach care related problems. And second would be cannula related problems. Poor tube and stomach care would lead to granulation tissue along the stoma tract, suprastomal collapse and granuloma, double lumen stoma tract, lower airway infection, and cannula related would be cannula tip granuloma stenosis and localized tracheomalation. This is an example of a stoma which is completely covered by granulation tissue. The stoma is hardly visible. The moment you remove the tracheostomy tube, the granuloma covers the stoma. So you need to treat this by removing all the granulation tissue. Normally we do with a bipolar coagulation forceps so that bleeding is minimized. We apply local gentamicin corticosteroid ointment and we explain the relatives to continue applying those ointments to prevent recurrence of granulation. And of course, infection is controlled with appropriate antibiotics as per the culture report. This picture, of course, is uh, from Professor Monia's uh, book, who is my mentor. This is a suprastomal collapse with granuloma. These are frequently seen in infants and children when they are taken for decannulation. Because when you start capping trial, because of this collapse and granuloma, they cannot be decannulated. And that's the time you need to have a look inside before decannulating them. And this, the treatment for this either would be removal of the granuloma or a tracheal resection or a tracheal reinforcement with PDS mini plates and anterior costal cartilage graft. Now I will show you a few examples which we have collected over a period of years. This is a two year old female with a bilateral vocal cord paralysis on tracheostomy since first week of life. As we do the scopy, you can see the collapse of the anterior wall with the granuloma, suprastomal granuloma. As you go down, you can see the tracheostomy tube, infrastomal trachea appears quite normal. This is another case example, a three and a half year old female with bilateral cord palsy, long-term tracheostomy, no care. There was a large suprastomal granuloma. Initially, we thought it looked like a foreign body or a cotton ball. But on palpation, it was very hard and thick, fibrous in nature. And it could not be held with the forceps also. So basically, it was required to be removed after intubating the patient and removing of the granuloma through the stoma. Another case example this is a 17-year-old female with CNS thrombosis and stroke with tracheostomy for six months. This is a suprastomal granuloma, which you can see. 
we did oral intubation oral tracheal intubation so that the granuloma could be seen through the stoma we removed the granuloma and this was the result six week post operative the area is healed well and you can see the tracheostomy tube in c2 which later on could be decannulated this is another example of suprastomal collapse four year old male with subglottic stenosis there was a tracheostomy due to post prolonged intubation on examination there was a subglottic uh, fibrous band which was dilated and lower down what we saw was complete collapse of the entire tracheal wall the tracheostomy tube was hardly visible almost more than 70 to 80% of the airway was obstructed here what we decided was we took the child exposed the neck and when we tried to see the anterior wall about two to three rings were very flaccid <coughs> we tried to do anterior tracheal resection here what we did was we didn't cut the posterior tracheal mucosa we kept that intact and just the anterior ring cartilaginous ring we removed two rings we removed and we could secure the uh, both the ends anteriorly and we intubate the patient post op for uh, five days kept intubated and this was the result after three months now these are few rare complications this is a double tracheal lumen where granulation start growing at the side of the tube and a time comes where a complete ring is formed and it leads to double lumen over a period of time this granulations get fibrotic and a cicatrizer ring is formed and it leads to double lumen we have a example for this which i would like to share with you this is an adult patient 20 year 22 year old male with a tracheostomy following tracheal stenosis poorly maintained stoma on endoscopic examination what you look down is not the tracheostomy tube with granulations and we try to put in a mixture through the stoma which is visible over there it comes out through the granulations then we put in a fibroelastic boogie from above and we try to see through the stoma which was not visible that means we confirm that there is a double lumen there is a bridge which was there in between which after suspension we removed that bridge of mucosa and then we could see the tracheostomy tube and as you can see there is lot of raw area all around and if we leave this without any treatment it will lead to restenosis so we decided to put in a t tube which was kept and fortunately the patient did well later on lower airway infection this is a case example where a 3 year old male with acquired on congenital stenosis with long term tracheostomy as you can see what you require is saline lavage clearing of all this crusting and an appropriate antibiotic as per the culture which can treat the infection now we go to the second group which is cannula related stenosis here it is which this we have already discussed cuff related problems are not very common in pediatric population because most of the time we use uncuffed tube and of course the tip related problems also we come across now this is an example of a 38 year old male with eight and a half cuff tube deflated since since last eight months it was not deflated on examination as you can see when we removed the tracheostomy tube after deflation of cuff you could see denuded and ulcerated mucosa all around the trachea and the tummy as we go down it's eroded denuded lot of granulations not only at the level of cuff but if you go lower down this was through the stoma which we did the scopy and if you go down what you can see is the anterior end was hitting the anterior wall of the trachea that also got ulcerated and eroded this if not taken care of can lead to severe complications now this is another example of a 3 year old female with a bilateral vocal cord palsy 
with a large and long tracheostomy tube. You see the size of the tube, it is snugly fitting into the airway. There is hardly any space to go with the scope beyond. And if you see the lower end of the tube was almost hitting the perina. The granulations at the level of carina. So this complications would be really very difficult to treat. This is another example of a 20 year old male with tracheostomy, posterior glottic stenosis, post prolonged intubation patient came with on and off bleeding from the tracheostoma. On examination, what we noticed was ulcerative lesion on the posterior wall with crusting on the posterior wall of the tracheal mucosa. So this, if not taken care, can lead to another complication that is a tracheoesophageal fistula. I can show you one example for that also. A 16-year-old male with cough post-decannulation and here you can see the tracheoesophageal fistula very clearly. Here what we decided is we took the patient and did the tracheal resection with end on closure of the fistula and anastomosis and this was the result 6-6 post-op. This is one of the very rare complications, tracheo-innominate artery fistula where the anterior end of the cannula goes on hitting the anterior wall of the trachea, leads to ulceration and necrosis of the tracheal wall and then damaging the innominate artery. To diagnose this early, you should see the pulsations on the tracheal cannula which can make you think that there is something wrong and the patient needs to get scoped and identify the site and the, the hemorrhage should be prevented. Now we come to post decannulation complications. This could be localized tracheomalacia, A-shaped deformity, suprastomal collapse and distal tracheal stenosis. Localized tracheal, tracheomalacia, basically to diagnose that, what you need to do is you remove the tracheostomy tube cannula, block the stoma and ask the patient to breathe spontaneously after occlusion of the orifice. And on spontaneous respiration, you will see that the child has difficulty in breathing or sometimes even strider. The treatment for this, of course, there is no endoscopic treatment. Either you go in for resection anastomosis if it is possible, or you can do tracheal reinforcement or with PDS mini plates or anterior costal cartilage graft. This is one example which I would want to share. This is a three and a half year old male operated for congenital grade four web, then decannulated and planned for surgical closure. There was a tracheocutaneous fistula. As you see the child on spontaneous respiration, there is in drawing of the anterior wall of the trachea, there's hardly any anterior wall. And when we scope this child, this was the scopy findings. There was anterior posterior collapse with almost obstruction up to 70 to 80 percent of the airway. And there we decided that we cannot do any closure of the fistula. We explained to the relatives, they followed up after a year and this was the finding at that time. The airway enlarged, the collapse had improved and the airway was much better than before. And that's the time later on we decided to do surgical closure of the tracheocutaneous fistula. Tracheal reinforcement, of course, is diagrammatic representation with PDS plates and sutures from Professor Monier's book. Now, the next example is A-frame tracheal deformity. This is another case example, a 13-year-old female with closure of tracheostomy done by pinching the skin and strapping the stoma. On examination, here the patient came with uh, dyspnea on exertion. She was completely okay at rest. You can see the A-shaped deformity very well. The treatment for this, of course, again would be resection anastomosis if possible or reinforcement with anterior cartilage graft and PDS plate. Distal tracheal stenosis are more difficult to treat. Again, the treatment would be either resection anastomosis if possible with a sternotomy may be required and endoscopic treatment with uh, probably CO2 laser 
to give radial cuts and balloon dilatation. A case example of 15 year old male with prolonged intubation on tracheostomy followed a SIF seven weeks later with biphasic strider. On examination, this was the finding. This was the tracheostomy site. And as we go lower down at the level of nine tracheal ring, there was grade three tracheal stenosis, a thick fibrotic ring. On radiological imaging, it was seen that it was a very small segment of stenosis. And what we decided was to do a tracheal resection with a CVTS standby. And fortunately, we could do through cervical approach without a sternotomy. And this was the result after three months. There are situations where resection is not possible. The stenosis is very long. It is lower down and you are not left with any other choice except doing a retracheostomy where you need to insert a long cannula bypassing the stenosis and you need to confirm the position with the scope whether it is going beyond the stenosis or not. If a long cannula tube is not available, you can at that moment use a non-cuffed endotracheal tube or maybe some temporary standing can help. This is a special case example which I would like to discuss at this forum. This is a 25 year old male with a long segment non-resectable tracheal stenosis developed post decannulation. This was the finding. This was the site of the tracheostoma. As you go down, it's a very tortuous airway, a long stenotic segment. Patient had presented with strider. What we decided at time, that time was just cutting this fibrous band with coal instruments and did dilatation, which was not really much. Patient marginally improved and then the patient was lost for follow-up. But I'm sure that this would recur. It would not be sufficient. And what would be the treatment for this type of cases? And that's why we thought of designing this silicon stents which can be inserted for these long stenotic segments where it is resection is not possible. This, of course, we have not used in pediatric patients. This has bewailed ends on both sides. This we have made for adult population with different diameters and different lengths. And as a case example, I would like to just show one where we have used this. This is the endoscopic examination where the tube is in place. It is fixed with two non-absorbable sutures. Because the upper and lower end are bewailed, the chances of granulations are not there. The inner surface of the silicon tube is very smooth. So there is no crusting and stagnation of secretions. And as you can see in this scan, the tube is lying in situ with the airway completely normal. And the main advantage here is the patient goes home immediately. There are no ICU stays. And the main thing what we do here is we try and avoid a retracheostomy in such cases. So to conclude, I would say prevention is better than cure. Thank you for your kind attention. And here I would like to thank my colleague, Dr. Anju Chaudhary, who's working with me for the last five years. And she is been keeping all the records and this presentation and all she has been very helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ezi. Again, a very illuminating talk of your vast experience. Uh, quick uh, responses and comments from our panel once again. Uh, this time I'll start with Deepak. Deepak, any comments uh, uh, related to this talk or uh, the previous two talks also? Can Deepak be unmuted, please? Yeah. Yeah, you can mute it. Okay. Um, I don't know where to start from. Uh, did we talk about uh, tracheocutaneous fistula? What do we do about it? Can I? There were a lot of questions about it. Oh, please, you can respond to the questions. So, regarding tracheocutaneous fistula, the, we need to just keep in mind whenever we are dealing with it, we need to see, make sure that all the problems have resolved. One of the things is how do you manage that? Do you just do core out the skin and treat it with secondary intention? Or 
you surgically close it. There's a lot of talk. And even, even if you ask people around the world, everyone has their own views on how they want to do it. Uh, my take on it is we, I, when I was in practice in Pittsburgh, uh, all my colleagues used to close it by surgical this thing. And I, from coming from Cincinnati, the teaching was to just stay, do it by secondary intention. So we actually looked at both together. One of the main things with doing a proper surgical closure is there is a risk of surgical emphysema. Even if you put a drain in, even af uh, afterwards, there is a risk of surgical emphysema. The other thing we looked at is it increases your stay in the hospital. When you core out the skin, more likely it will heal. You can pretty much send them the same day or a day after. Uh, and there's little complication rate is low. But when you're doing it, the main reason it will fail is if you don't take the skin out completely, you need to go down to the tracheal wall to get all the skin out. If you get all the skin out, then the chances of it healing properly is much, much higher. Uh, or almost always it will heal because, because you've done that. The other assessment you have to do is some of the cases which, uh, which were shown by Izzy, they, if there is a shortage of the tracheal wall, if the tracheal wall is collapsing, then you have two options. Either you resect and bring the two ends together, or you can put an anterior cartilage graft there because usually it's collapsing because it doesn't have the strength. So you need to just put an anterior graft there so that it gives uh, some, or you might have to resect. And with uh, tracheal... Uh, A-frame deformity, not all A-frame deformities need correction. Just because on your scope you see an A-frame deformity, it doesn't mean that you have to do something about it. You have to do something only in the symptomatic patient. So if they have issues going on, then I think resection will be your best option in those situations. Sometimes you can do plating like uh, Izzy showed, um, but those are situations where you don't have to do anything. There was another comment on what if you see tracheomalacia? And usually, when you see tracheomalacia, keep in mind it's because of either there is a primary problem, then you need to wait for the primary problem to resolve. But if it is because of an airway problem, it's usually because of Bernoulli phenomenon, where because the child is breathing through a narrow airway, the distal end might be collapsing because of that. So keep that in mind and fix the primary problem. So if there is any stenosis, any narrowing, fix that, and usually that will fix the uh, take Malaysia. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, I thought there would be some kind of a, you know, ideological difference across the Atlantic between Europe and the US and also between the, across the English Channel. I'm sure there are various um, differences uh, in approach. Um, Kishore, can you just uh, say something else that you do differently in terms of both the tracheostomy and uh, approaches to uh, uh, post tracheostomy problems or is it essentially the same everybody thinks the same way well, i think um, uh, thank you very much for uh, the talk uh, Vali. Uh, so you know just to come to the point where you know you have a long segment tracheal stenosis so we actually prefer to do a slide tracheoplasty in a situation like this which has the advantage of keeping in fact the endo tracheal mucosa, so the endo, endo, endo tracheal mucosa is remaining as is intact. So one of the options in the long segment tracheal stenosis would be a slight tracheoplasty as against, in fact, you know, yes, the option of an anterior graft is still there, but still the anterior graft is a free graft. So the chances of getting infected because of whether it is an upper respiratory tract infection or whatever it is, still the chances of a secondary infection and a recurrence of the stenosis is still there as against an airway which is completely epithelialized by a slight tracheoplasty if a resection anastomosis is not possible. I think one of the important things that I think is really critical is a suprastomal collapse. So I look at suprastomal collapse as either something which is isolated or unique or that which is associated with other laryngotracheal lesions. I'll explain. So let's say, the de finally, let's face the fact, it's the decannulation, which is the ultimate goal in all these patients. So if it is a unique isolated, isolated suprastomal collapse, then there are various options. As um, uh, Vali has said, you know, you could think in terms of either resecting that area, if it is a circumferential peristomal collapse, 
Where I think what is critical is the craniocaudal length. So there are various things that one needs to take into consideration. For me, it is the stomal demography. So by stomal demography, I mean, is it a small size or a contracted tracheostoma? Is it an adequate size or is it too large? So if it is too long and large, then the story is different. If it is contracted, slightly it is different. And if there is a peristomal circumferential stenosis, the situation is totally different. You add to that one more thing, that would mean that if there is an additional laryngotracheal lesion, or if the patient already has had treatment in the past, typically related to an airway resection. So that's where, in fact, the polydioxinone mini plates will start coming in. So I think it's not just taking treating of suprastomal collapse. One needs to see the, the patient as a whole, and that's where, in fact, one needs to realize whether it is a unique or an isolated suprastomal collapse, or is it associated with something else. We have just published, or it is in press, algorithm for how actually you do or choose a surgery for your suprastomal collapses. So I think that is something which is really important. And this is, again, you know, it's a kind of a repetition. It is based on stomal demography, previous surgeries, and associated laryngotracheal lesions. So I think um, these are a couple of uh, things uh, which are uh, critical to realize in a suprastomal collapse patient. Remember, why do you get a suprastomal collapse? Remember, if a very tracheostomy has been done at a very young age, so there is probably a partial arrest of the tracheal growth. Or if the tracheostomy or tracheotomy with a tracheal incision is too small and a larger tracheostomy, tracheostomy cannula is inserted, whether it is the primary insertion or it is a late tube change or whatever it is. Finally, what are we looking at? It is the cutaneous part of the tracheostomy cannula which actually increases the peristomal uh, uh, trauma which leads into chondritis, which leads into you know, localized inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where, in fact, there have been articles where they have said that a vertical incision, what Deepak was saying, the vertical incision has got lesser chances of going into a suprastomal collapse uh, as against, in fact, a horizontal inverted or a horizontal reversed uh, tracheostomy, which is something similar to a modified Biox flap. So to me, I think, apart from the tracheal incision, the point for younger colleagues on the panel would be that it is a smaller size tracheal incision for a larger size tracheostomy cannula, either at the primary insertion or at late tube changes. So I think that is critical, which will avoid any kind of localized trauma. Uh, Kishore, any, any age criteria for slight tracheoplasty? No, and there is no age well, or, or I, you can do it at any age. Oh, yeah. I have done a slight tracheoplasty for a one month old kid with uh, O ring trachea. I mean, if you have an O ring trachea, uh, you know, you don't, you cannot do a tracheostomy. You cannot intubate them. What choices do you have? So, um, a bypass uh, a procedure, a sternotomy, a cervical sternotomy, and a slight tracheoplasty. This for the complete. It's pretty trachea. interesting. It's, it's pretty interesting, you know, because of the COVID situation. We had a 60-year-old female who actually want, who had to undergo a tracheostomy. So my resident, when he actually started doing the tracheostomy, he is, you know, we use um, size 6.5 for an adult female and a size 7.5 for an adult male. It's slightly smaller sizes, but we prefer that. So he tried to insert the cannula, couldn't go in. And in fact, you know, he was a little surprised because, you know, the tube that was put primarily couldn't go go in correctly as well at the primary in, uh, intubation time. They tried to do a tracheostomy, the 6.5 couldn't go in. He tried a 6, couldn't go in. Tried a 5.5, couldn't go in. And that's where, in fact, he said, that, ah, something which is not going correctly. He did a flexible endoscopy through a size 5 endotracheal tube, which was, in, which was used at in, uh, intubation. He picked up O-ring trachea in a 60-year-old female, and you don't have a choice. He put, in an he put in a tracheostomy cannula, but which was a size 5 bivona. 
So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes, you know, these patients are sort of, you know, missed out. And that's where the importance of doing a flexible endoscopy or some kind of endoscopy to pick up some kind of endotracheal problem whilst you are doing a tracheostomy. Again, how many cases there are, it all depends upon your workload. Um, going ahead, uh, um, Suja, you have some questions you want to start out at this moment because we have uh, both Shashidhar and Rakesh who have some uh, cases which we can discuss. Are there a number of questions? If Suja is not there, any questions in the list you want to be addressed right away? There are some, there are some questions regarding surgical yes. closure. Uh, surgical closure, whether that is preferred or uh, uh, secondary intention, closing by secondary intention is preferred. That's been covered to some extent, isn't it? Or uh, um, anything? Uh, I, I think we'll go ahead. Uh, with that. that was just answered by Deepak, I think. Okay. Any other questions? In, uh, questions which are out of the way, which we didn't discuss up till now? I think peristomal granulations, I think, has. Uh, you know, there was, I think Dr. Deepa showed one slide uh, on peristomal yeah. granulations, florid peristomal granulations. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, let's ask our experts. Yeah. Uh, Deepak or Kishore or Mary, anyone wants to tell us how they will manage that? Sorry. Florid, peristomal, the question. florid peristomal granulations. It was shown by Dr. Deepa in one of the cases. So how would you manage that? Uh, so typically what we would do is, one, you need to say, is, is it colonized with bacteria or is it because the trach tube is rubbing? Usually it is because the trach tube is rubbing too much and you, don't, you have not put a barrier in between, you're not taking care of things. That could be, or it could be that it's colonized with bacteria. So typically I would, I would take a culture from that and then uh, we use silver nitrate to... Uh, we use uh, silver nitrate to uh, cauterize the granuloma, whatever is peristomal outside, and then start them on an antibiotic uh, ointment to be applied there. And so those will be your main thing, having the antibiotics, cauterizing it, and then creating a barrier. I've and seen you use a hemostat and then uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, pressing it and then removing it, isn't that that's one of the ways? So you can, if it is too big and obvious, yeah. Yeah. Um, then yes, you can remove it and then you can cauterize the edges and then do the thing. If it is small enough that you can cauterize, it'll shrink it down, that could be fine as well. And I'll just tell you one more thing about the suprastomal, adding to uh, Kishore's point. See, pretty much every tracheostomy tube when it is in, it will show you some amount of suprastomal drag. So it's very, very important for you to assess exactly what it is like, how Kishore was describing. It's very important for you to assess. So the best way to assess is take the trach tube out, and then you do your bronchoscopy. So you look at the stoma once the trach tube is out. The other thing you need to do is you can have a skin hook, and you can put it and just get a feel of how much. Because eventually, when the trach tube comes out, everything will fall back in. So you might be sometimes over assessing a suprastomal granuloma uh, collapse. So you need to have that assessment where you are making sure that this is really a problem. So get that trach tube out, assess, get a feel of the tissue there, and then based on that assessment, you go up with the plan. We've got a short time left. Um, uh, Rakesh uh, and Shashi, who wants to go first? You can present your case. You can have a little case discussion. Yeah, your co-host. Okay. Uh, hello. Am yeah, I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me share the presentation. Why is it saying? Sick. So this is about tracheostomies. Uh, just one second. Hello. Dr. Pella, something, uh, it's giving the whiteboard sharing. It's not giving me the computer sharing. I don't know. You're sharing uh, this thing, I think, artboard, whiteboard. 
you have to share you have opened your powerpoint presentation yes it's open yeah, yeah. you choose powerpoint presentation from out of that you know no it, it's kind of only giving me the option of uh, a whiteboard it's not giving me any other option select a window or application you want to share it's just giving me a whiteboard oh ah should be showing uh, try once again sharing reshare new share try, share the whiteboard first then do the new share okay no. now it's the whiteboard but okay. i go back to new share new share yeah new share or share screen just a sec sorry about all this now we are able to see the option four point have you opened the uh, powerpoint presentation i have opened the powerpoint presentation new share and it's 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 not coming um <coughs> Uh, Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Rakesh can go. Yeah, Rakesh, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, under what name he is logged in? I can't see his name here. Rakesh, are you there? Can you take my desktop and then try it? Uh... Mm, yeah, I can do that. Uh, request desktop control. Mm, Shashi, where are you? Meanwhile, Dr. Thiru, he's another airway surgeon from Chennai. He's there. I can see him. Thiru, welcome. And uh, we'll just ask you for your comments in between as soon as we have uh, some air time for you. Okay. Can you can you see this? Uh, yeah, yes, we can, can see now. We can see yeah. now. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. <laughs> so this is a case which dates back uh, in 2007. Uh, 2013 to by uh, 13, I think. Yeah, 2013, uh, no, 2007. Sorry. So this was while I was doing my senior residency, and we had a call from the NICO that there's a newborn kid with a cystic hygroma. Uh, they intubated the kid, and they gave two extubation trials, which failed, and the child was in strider. Now we were asked to do a tracheostomy, and it always looks very challenging and intimidating to have such a big mass. But what we did not anticipate was just not the procedure, but if you do a tracheostomy in this kid, what happens later? That was the, you know, short-sightedness we missed on this kid. And what happened was, like, when you give an incision, it kind of, uh, Dr. Pella, you have to uh, go to the next slide. Okay, I don't, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you give an incision, a whole lot of fluid came out. The child's uh, weight and the cystic hygroma weight were in a ratio of 1 is to 3. It was a huge, almost 1.2 liter cystic hygroma of the neck. And when you uh, gave an incision, the child went into shock and decompensation. Luckily, we had cannulas in place and we kind of revived the kid and everything. But when the fluid came out and everything, and we went for the tracheostomy procedure per se, uh, it was done. But at that, 15 years back, we did not really have a cuffed tracheostomy tube at the, those times, at least in the hospital supply. So we had put a rush tube here, uh, maybe about the size 3.5, and it just went in, and we were able to ventilate the kid and somehow save the kid. Now, two days after the procedure, what happens, this fluid starts reaccumulating and it starts seeping inside the tracheal hole. And when that, that happens, we were using a modified endotracheal tube with a cuff to uh, ventilate it. And then we got some place to get us a cuffed uh, endotracheal tube and we changed it to the cuff endotracheal tube. But the peristomal area, which got necrosed after a week, gave way and this child had a internal decannulation as in the tube was from the skin inside uh, through the neck but the inner uh, fly in the lumen of the tube was not inside the trachea and we 
lost this kid so take home message is uh, if if you have a large neck mass and especially cystic hygroma you 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 should be really really conservative that if there's any way you can avoid a uh, tracheostomy even if it means taking the kid for a surgery or keeping the kid intubated and giving bleomycin or sclerotherapy or uh, even just aspirating it uh, under ultrasound there are several methods to avoid a tracheostomy then just to go ahead and do a tracheostomy because the post tracheostomy care which should be thought before uh, is extremely challenging so lesson learned in same similar presentation another kid we did not do a tracheostomy we kept him intubated for 7 to 10 days uh, aspiration and bleomycin aspiration and bleomycin and this kid uh, escaped through so this one is the case second is a case he was a 7 year old kid who fell from uh, second floor of his house and he had a cervical fracture so th th this is uh, my own creation on photoshop just to show the cervical plates the problem here is his neck and chest were exactly touching each other and there is no way you can access the cervical trachea so in such anatomical uh, problems how do you do a tracheostomy number one secondly while fixing the plate the cervical team the neurosurgery team did not discuss with us that they're going to extubate this kid ideally they should have been tracheostomized at the time of original surgery and they kind of missed out on it and when they extubated the child could not manage the secretions were drowning in the secretion then had a problem so this was the only place where we had to do endoscopic assisted tracheostomy and using a lateral approach instead of conventional anterior wall we had to do it on the lateral side which is which is about uh not in the midline but slightly towards the uh on the lateral side and finding a furrow and everything now the funny thing what happened was in this patient when the tube change was done uh, i didn't anticipate it and it had to be done in the ot and i thought i could just railroad it on a rails tube and i took a rails tube and i railroaded it and it did go into the false track we had to do a code blue and we nearly lost the kid this kid was revived by me manually blowing air through the tracheostomy stoma uh, using an et tube so he had a neck emphysema but till the time we were shifting him to the ot uh, we were just manually blowing uh, air through the tracheostomy stoma and this this kid uh, we did a fiber optic scopy and we saw the tracheal opening because uh, as soon as the tracheostomy tube was removed the trachea sl slid a little bit down and uh, with the fiber optic tube through the stoma we were able to put the tracheostomy tube back in the, and he did fine so after 6 months uh, his tracheostomy was decannulated and so many other things but this was the most terrifying uh, tracheostomy change uh, for the kid and for myself both uh, so so the bottom line here is you also need to use a fiber optic for tracheostomy tube change in difficult tracheostomies uh, rail roading cannot be the only uh, safest way to do again uh, tracheoesophageal fistula and tracheostomy uh, doctor kishore will take it up what are the uh, nuances when you are doing a tracheostomy okay. because the problem is if you keep the tube above okay. patient will not ventilate and the air will leak through the fistula if you keep down the cuff will be here and this will increase the fistula size so you are actually stuck between the devil and the deep sea if you have an iatrogenic tracheoesophageal fistula the only way you could get around is actually use a very long flange tracheostomy tube which has adjustable keep it just above the uh, carina and try not to inflate the cuff unless absolutely required and this ng tube or feeding it is better it is converted to a pedge uh, uh, percutaneous gastrostomy if you have to manage this this is another very challenging place where tracheostomies are very difficult last is this one 
when you have to do a tracheostomy especially in a kid or an adult with ARDS uh, we always have this problem of as soon as you do tracheostomy the patient saturations keeps falling and you're not able to ventilate it well the anesthetist will shift over to the endotracheal tube from above and the ventilation is surprisingly very good when you close the neck but uh, there is a lot of peep loss and this has to be discussed prior to the procedure that uh, endotracheal peep and the tracheostomy tube may differ because uh, of several reasons the angulation of the cuff or the tracheostomy tube and other things and it's very difficult to go on a 13 or 14 peep when you have tracheostomy tube uh, for an ARDS patient. These are the points which I wanted to make. Dr. Kishore, Dr. Deepak, uh, we had wonderful insights from you. Can you can you just add on the things which I have missed on for uh, tracheostomy neck masses? Yeah, unmute uh, Deepak and uh, Kishore uh, for their comments. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Deepak. Oh, no, you go ahead, Kishore. All right. So, congratulations, Shashi. I think they were fantastic, uh, you know, uh, albatross cases. Uh, just a couple of things as far as cystic hygromas are concerned. So, yeah, they look quite difficult to, you know, manage, but actually they are quite all right to intubate. So, you know, if you have to th talk about intubation, the easiest is if it was a left sided cystic hygroma, let that mass fall towards the gravity and the airway opens up. So as far as the intubation in a typical exit procedure is concerned for a cystic hygroma, it's not all that bad. Coming intubated to sort of, you know, uh, either sort of securizes airway. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the situation is you don't want your tracheostomy site to get uh, infected because of the cystic hygroma liquid that sort of, you know, comes out. So there are two ways of looking at it. In the multidisciplinary clinic that we have, we decide either the kid is going to go in for a sclerotherapy or is going to go in for a surgery. For us, it's a very clear idea. What are those cases that go in for a sclero or those, go, those guys who go in for a surgery? For whatever case, if it is a surgical sort of intervention, then we will put in a tracheostomy, but anyway, the cystic hygroma is out. So probably the tracheostomy is much easier. If it is a sclerotherapy situation, then we need to be very clear how to do a tracheostomy. And this is exactly the point that you don't want to mess up with the liquid sort of, you know, going all around the tracheostomy site and getting infected and, you know, getting leaked around uh, with the cystic hygroma. But I think you did well. Uh, the only thing is that, um, uh, yes, you need to anticipate this because it can uh, risk into getting infected. The second thing uh, is as regards your tracheoesophageal fistula patient. So if it is possible, try to get operate, try to operate the fistula as quickly as possible. If it is not possible, and if it is a story of temporizing the tracheoesophageal fistula for some other reason, then there are various options. You could think in terms of a stent, which could actually, it's a Dumo stent, so, you know, you don't want too much of expansion in that area because anyways, in the future, when you will be operating for the fistula, uh, you would be taking, you know, whether it is a, a one centimeter or a 1.5 centimeter fistula, or if it is a two centimeter fistula, you know, the surgical uh, 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 steps will change slightly. But eventually, you know, uh, the surgical steps are not going to change too much. We are talking of temporizing the situation. So either you can think in terms of a stent maybe on the esophageal side, or you can even think in terms of, you know, these gels that we use for medialization procedures in the larynx. So, you know, that can be used again on the esophageal side, but not on the, on the tracheal side to avoid uh, airway compromise. So it depends what you, either you want to go in with a quick surgery or you want to temporize the situation for other, you know, problems that the patient may have. Situations are there either with stents or by injection, uh, uh, injection procedures. Last point was with your uh, patient with the flexed uh, child who was plated for his cervical spine problem. So again, these patients, I think what I would have done is I would have always relied on flexible bronchoscopy, a transnasal flexible bronchoscopy. I would have put in, a, after we are in the airway, 
we would put in a small uh, catheter through uh, the uh, through the working channel of the bronchoscope. I would then thread a Cook tube exchanger. A Cook tube exchanger always has got a small catheter, so you can always give oxygen uh, to. You can always uh, oxygenate the child. Once that has been taken care of. If the story is to do a tracheostomy, you can either go ahead. Yes, I do understand that it is a little difficult with the flex position, but it's not impossible. So if you are talking about uh, securing your airway, yes, it can be done. Then by putting in a small cook exchanger, the cook, you know, the cook company, uh, Boston Scientific, so they have a small sort of you know, exchanger which they have. So they can be put, that can be put through the nose, that can be connect, that can be used for ventilation. Uh, and oxygenation, uh, and uh, you know you can go ahead with your tracheostomy. Those are good points. Thanks, Deepak. Any comments? Yeah. So, um, um, Sashi, uh, very nice uh, cases, um, and very brave of you to show your difficult ones as well. So, comments on cystic fibroma or lymphatic malformation kids those kids are always like Kishore said, you can intubate those. And usually those cystic, uh, the lymphatic malformations are very soft. So with your laryngoscope, you can push them away. So you'll be almost always, you should be able to put a tube in those airways. Uh, it's not that difficult. So uh, this kid was intubated twice and they were only failing the extubation part. So they kind of yeah. sent it for the airway so, management. What I would have done is I would have assessed the airway to say there is no way you will be able to extubate this kid, okay? And told them that this is not the right time for trach, that which you did with the other case, is that at that point you need to say, what do I do with the mask? Like Kishore said earlier, you need to start to think what would be my next step? And it's better to, with the intubated kid, do start the sclerotherapy, for example, if this is amenable for sclerotherapy, start the sclerotherapy, keep the kid intubated, have some response to the sclerotherapy. And then when you come to a point where you need to extubate at that point, the airway would be a lot more, less um, bigger. So it would, do, it would have come down. So it would have avoided even a trach in some of these cases. Right. Absolutely. Um, so getting an MRI to see exactly what it is, if it is a lot of macrocystic, bleomycin would work and it would shrink it down. If it is microcystic, then you can start thinking whether I should go ahead and resect it before I do it. The other thing, when you do a trach on some of these patients where you have fluctuation, it's very important to have the longer tube because, and then using a flexible scope is very important to make sure your tube is sitting in the right spot. So uh, that will make a difference. You can't use the standard size trach tubes for these cases. You'll have to use a longer tube and you have to make sure that the tube is in the right spot. In, okay. in yeah. one of the kids, yeah. Go ahead, Deepak. Uh, the, um, the second, the tracheoesophageal fistula kid, uh, I think Kishore made good points. I, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, in one of our cystic hygroma cases, Shashi, uh, where sclerotherapy was given, and then uh, we were, had to do a tracheostomy subsequently for whatever reason, uh, it was difficult to identify the trachea. So we used the aiming uh, laser the fiber uh, inside, it would transilluminate and uh, make sure that we are at the right place. These things can be used to make sure that the trachea, I mean, the identification of the trachea mm -hmm. and the rings, because everything is malicious to some extent in that, those cases, we found that very useful in that particular case. Um, without much ado, I think we need to request uh, Rakesh to quickly present this case. We've got a short time. Uh, Rakesh, if you can uh, quickly, one case. Are you ready, Rakesh? Is Rakesh unmuted? Uh, he's, he's unmuted, sir. He's not muted, but uh, with what name he has logged in? Rakesh, sir. He's with the number, sir, 994023. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's with our, uh, okay. He's joined the CBI. Uh, yeah, make host, okay. Make co host, yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. You can, you can now log in. Hello, Rakesh? Yeah, quickly. We've got a short time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just. Yeah. <laughs> quickly.
Drakesh is taking time. Uh, Thiru, are you in the audience? Just see Dr. Tirunav Karasu. Yeah, he is there. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thiru, thanks for joining in and uh, uh, please uh, participate actively in the coming sessions. Sure, sir. Sure. And if you have any comments on today's proceedings, uh, till Rakesh comes, you can uh, make any comments if you feel like. <laughs> hello. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah, hello. Oh, yeah, Am I audible? Back to starting. Yeah, okay. Thiru, we'll get back to you later. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see the screen. No, no. Uh, if you're playing a video directly, then you will have to share uh, the application you're going to use. Whether uh, you're using window, Windows Media Player, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to share the Windows Media Player application. Okay. Yeah. You can see that uh, Dr. Prahlad is not only a medical brain, but also a technical brain. He comes to sort out all these problems. Thanks, Prahlad. Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, this yeah, is a, this is a. We still don't have the video. You don't have the video. No, no. Yeah, go to share, uh, share screen and uh, share that video. The Windows Media application. You open the Windows Media application first. Know what is some problem is there? Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Is coming? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. You're good to go. Yeah. This is a baby. I think last time I discussed it. This is a case of a Perry Robin sequence, and. Uh, if you can see, this patient was tracheostomized. You refer to me for failed decannulation. So what I saw is a suprastomal granulation. Almost occluding the whole of the tracheal ribbon. So, we lost the video. Mm -hmm. oh. Now you're getting it? No. No, no. You'll have to reshare it again. So one of the important points we didn't cover today is uh, doing tracheostomy during COVID times. So that's uh, something that we probably need to discuss because a couple of uh, centers uh, whom I was in touch with, they got in touch with us to find out how to go about it. And um, we had had a session earlier, which was um, uh, curated by Dr. Jayanti Pavitran and uh, the COVID issues were discussed, but I think in the coming uh, segments, maybe we should talk about that. Oh, then I assessed the patient through transoral, so I was prepared that I will not be able to see even the inlet of the larynx. So this was like grade four uh, combat hand grading, and you can see just the hippie glottis, and there's a huge tongue was there. So my question is how to manage that suprastomal generation. to my uh, expert from Dr. Kishore and Dr. Deepak, because I managed it through a uh, retrograde approach. I will just share it again. It stops, sir. Yeah, I'll just resume the share. Hmm. 
Now you can see that? Uh, no. We don't have it. Okay. Rakesh, just try once. If it's not possible, then we'll uh, probably have it in the next segment. Now it is coming? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Good, good. Yeah. So, uh, finally, what I did is I approached it through the retrograde approach. And uh, finally, the dissection was done using a hyper extension of the neck using 30 and 0 degree telescope and using a, a micro divider. So, This was a laryngeal uh, skimmer, which we use it for the papillomas. It's one of those uh, MLW. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, sorry, this is a debrider you're using. Sorry. Yeah. So finally, we looked at retrogately, and now you can see the base of the tongue is quite huge here. And now we place the Laryngoscope from the other end to look for the. So there are other options also which uh, uh, I have used it like uh, giraffe forcep for this removal of this generation. Uh, and in adult, this like this. Now you can see the base of the tongue and there's a Macintosh laryngoscope which is placed just at the. So it's almost pushing the epiglottis down. And finally, this baby was decorrelated. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, what are the options available? So I'd like to... Quick comments from the panel, anyone? One of the easiest ways to take a suprasomal granulation is to intubate it. When you intubate it, the granulation yeah. is right on front of the stoma and it's easy to pick it up. Uh, that's 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 one of the easiest way to pick it up. Otherwise, we'll be digging, digging, digging. Yes. Right. No, but in this case, uh, the- Intubation was not possible. I'm, I'm just not saying- possible. This is even, absolutely. Uh, it was tube and tube out. So uh, absolutely. even initially we thought we can put a LMA from above and then uh... you can stop sharing the screen, sir. Rakesh, sir. Yeah. So these are uh, the more difficult cases, and uh, thank you very much, Rakesh and uh, Doctor uh, uh, Shashi, for sharing these um, unusual cases with us. And uh, any final comments from our? Uh, from our panelists, uh, Dr. Mary, anything you want to say? Um, I want this Dr. Rakesh's case was it? I think when you remove the granulation, maybe before debriding it completely or in the beginning, take a little bit of tissue for cultures because it's yeah, uh, yeah, very yeah. Hard. All 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 the granulation we took it. Yeah, that's fine. And plus, uh, we use uh, nowadays we starting using uh, mupromycin, and we found a very good response with. And we present. And I use a cotinoid patty with mitomycin also, and uh, locally inject. Yeah, uh, well, sometimes it, because uh, hospital acquired infections, they can be having some uh, nosocomial uh, drug resistant infection also. This uh, yeah. uh, granulation tissue, which is uh, quite uh, exotic. You know? uh, thank you so, so I, much. I think uh, we are almost come to the end of our time allotment and we've exceeded a little bit, but then Prahlad is always a very kind host. He knows that guests like us don't leave so easily, so it's fine. <laughs> so regarding the uh, uh, audience there, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are doing excellent work. It's a very democratic stage. Please uh, step on. I know Diana is there somewhere. Anju is there somewhere. Uh, Dr. Mrithanjai Bilagi is there. Amit is there. Thiru, of course, was there. So please, as and when you feel you want to present something, please let us know. We get enriched by your experience. I, I would really sincerely thank both Kishore and Deepak for being here with us. And um, they, they've been supporting us for many, many years. Uh, 
So please continue to do that. We are really enriched by your experience. Prahlad for giving us the stage, Suja uh, for kindly consenting to be, I know you're a very experienced person. We need some presentations from you also. Mary as uh, usual, she's always there for, uh, for our programs. So I want to thank all of you and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajay and uh, Dr. Ezi and Deepa. They talked to each other and they kind of coordinated the whole uh, topic so well. I didn't have anything much to do. And Suja, thank you for standing by for me when I couldn't enter because... Uh, I, I have a small request. Uh, do we have permission to post this on our website and uh, YouTube channels? Uh, if so, all the presenters, just please raise your hands. That's all. Just show me thumbs up. Yeah. Should be yeah. okay from my side. Okay. And uh, who else? Dr. Easy. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all. Let us meet again. Let us meet again next uh, weekend. Okay. Next we time. are getting queries okay. about decannulation in pediatrics and this COVID era tracheostomy okay. and how to handle granulation as far as steroid and mitomycin is concerned. So you want to take all this in a next session, sir? Uh, you you can go ahead. Uh, if if Raman, sir, is you, under it, busy. you want to do it now or to do it later? Session probably. Separate, separately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. It's like a, it should oh, be yeah. an ongoing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll do that. In the we'll do that. Era. <laughs> yeah. Very important. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, uh, thank, you thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a good week. Yeah.